So as a child of the 70s and 80s, I spent a lot of time in CD arcades pumping quarters into video games like Donkey Kong and Miss Pac-Man. And as I tackled these challenges, it was my goal to try to achieve the highest score, to try and get lots and lots of points. And the game rewarded that. It offered up lots of challenges for me to engage with. And every time I jumped over a barrel or saved the princess, points would pop up and head up there and I would be happy. But the game designers, they wanted to make this game challenging. And so they always had these risks I had to undertake. I only had three lives, and if I made a mistake, I lost a life. And if I lost all my lives, it was game over, and I had to fish out another quarter. Over the last 30 years, video games have changed quite a bit. Now that we've got games on, our, on the home consoles, we no longer need to feed quarters into them. And instead, we've gotten away from points and lives. And instead, we have these spaces that you get to explore. But these games are about exploring stories and exploring your character and getting stronger and exploring relationships. And these sorts of games engage you. And if you make a mistake and die or pass out, well, you get another chance. And you have as many chances as you want. So in some ways, we've actually traded out these fake lives for our own life. That the game designer says, give us more of your life and you can play this game more. But what else has happened is we're sharing these lives with other people. Online games like World of Warcraft have created spaces where millions of people come together and engage with each other. And even solo games have online forums where people engage with each other. And it's this space, this social space of gaming are allowing people to take gaming journeys together. And I'm going to invite all of you to join me on the gamification journey. My name is Scott Nicholson, and I work with games and play and make transformative games. I'm going to help you see how you can use these games to transform people around you. So you might have heard of this term, gamification. Gamification is the idea of adding a game or play layer to the real world. And you've actually done it. Picture, if you would, a trash can in front of you. And you've just picked up a piece of paper. No one's around. No one's looking. You wad up that piece of paper. And you decide to see if you can make that shot, to see if you can make it in. You've just added a game layer to your real world. You've just used gamification. You've just given yourself a little obstacle, something to feel good about. Here's my definition of gamification, that gamification is the application of gameful or playful layers to motivate engagement within a specific context. So the idea is that there's some context out there and you want to motivate people to get involved with it. So you add some sort of gameful or playful layer on top of it to encourage them to engage with it. Now, who is this for? Well, if you're a parent or you're a teacher, you know your day is spent trying to motivate people to do stuff. If you're a boss or a team leader, you know you're motivating folks. If you're a mentor or a big brother or a big sister, you're motivating people. And if you're none of those things, you will be at some point in your life. But you can also use gamification to motivate yourself. So I want you to take a minute and think about a challenge in your life that you'd like to motivate other people to engage with or you'd like to motivate yourself to do better with. Think about that and carry that with you as we go through our journey together. Now, let me tell you about one gamification system that's out there right now called Zamzi. Zamzi is a system designed to help kids exercise more. The idea is that parents buy a pedometer from Zamzi, and the kids wear it, and as they run around and play, they accumulate points. And they can come back and plug in their pedometer, log their points, and then exchange those for rewards. And if those virtual rewards aren't enough, Zamzi allows the parents to purchase goals where they can buy money and then deposit that money with Zamzi, and Zamzi will then distribute the money to the kids as they've earned different levels of points. And Zamzi reports they've seen this great boost in how much kids exercise after they start using Zamzi. So we'll come back to this system a little bit later. This concept of reward-based gamification, there's a few basic structures. And think about your own challenge as I talk about these. Now first, the basic tool here are points. You want to figure out how do you reward people for doing stuff, and you're going to give them points for doing things. Now, just accumulating a lot of points is not that interesting. So you need some way for people to think about their piles of points. And one way of doing is by giving people levels. So the idea of levels is it makes that big pile of points make more sense. You go from level one to two to three. And as you go up in levels, you're progressing further in the system. You can also allow people to think about points through leaderboards, where you see how many points you have and then where you rank amongst other people. But what leaderboards do is they actually group people into two groups. There's the people that you hate and the people that hate you. So you want to be careful when you use leaderboards to motivate people. I actually tried using them in one of my classes. It was a very, very bad thing. <laughs> achievements are another way of helping people to explore a world. Now, achievements are kind of like extra credit in class. 
There are things that aren't on the syllabus, but they're, they're like going to a talk or going to a movie or doing something above and beyond that encourage you to explore space in different ways. You know, actually, speaking of extra credit, I call the syllabus gamification of the classroom because it is this gameful layer that's applied to this non-game context. It's not a very good game, but it's still a game, and it's the idea that teachers use these points to motivate kids to do stuff. So if you want to think about gamification, it's like the syllabus in the classroom. And then badges. Badges are some way of having a public display of any aspect of this system. So you put all this together. This is the reward-based gamification process. So if you could actually apply all of this to your challenge, and you could have some boost in engagement. And as I started to study this, I came across this book, Gamification by Design. This is the O'Reilly book on this topic. And I hit this quote. Once you start giving someone a reward, you have to keep her in that reward loop forever. And when I read this quote, I got very concerned. I work a lot with libraries. And I thought about libraries adding gamification and then finding out that they can't get rid of it. Now, if I were some sort of a, a, you know, a, a gamification consultant, I'd love this. Yes, you have to subscribe to my stuff forever. But I wanted to figure out what was actually going on. And I read these two books. And I'll point you to these two books if you want to explore these concepts. Daniel Pink's Drive. Now, if you're in the business industry concept, Drive is the book to look at. And what he had talks about is the idea that if you use rewards to motivate someone on a creative task, they won't do as well as if they'd just been enabled to do it. Now, you can use rewards on things that aren't creative, rote tasks, and people will do them more quickly, but not necessarily better. But as soon as you bring a creative task into it, people get so focused on the reward that they can no longer think creatively. And they're just trying to do what they need to do to get the reward, which if you're a teacher, you know you've dealt with this. Is there going to be a grade for this? It's, we've actually broken our students by having these gamification systems in classes. Punished by rewards is more about education and parenting. And Alfie Cohn talks about self-determination theory and presents hundreds of studies which explore the same phenomenon, that if you have motivation to do something, and then you're rewarded to do that thing, when the rewards are taken away, your motivation is lower than when you began. You actually hurt people's motivation by giving them rewards. So you take a library with a summer reading program. Kids get to have gold stars and pizza for reading books, and they read lots of books. And then when that summer reading program is over, their intrinsic motivation is damaged. They're worse off than when they started. This is a concern. And I started to think about, well, what's going on here? And it's because we've been focusing just on that scoring system and focusing on what's going on with these rewards. And we've actually found that if you give someone the same reward over time, they get desensitized to it. They get to the fact that same reward doesn't make as big of a difference. And that's a problem, especially when you're using gamification to change people in the long term. There's a tool called Photocracy. Photocracy is a tool that tracks points as you exercise. And what they've found, they've done some surveys of users, this just came out, that the users who've used Photocracy report that their enjoyment and the usefulness of the gamification decreases with use. And we're seeing this pattern of gamification. It's called the gamification backlash. Michael Wu termed that. And the idea is that once you start getting involved with gamification, there's this initial spike, this short-term engagement, you're really excited about it, and then it crashes. Now, that's not so bad if that's your goal. If you've got a short-term goal, I just want to sell something. And so I'm going to get you engaged with points. You're going to get excited about it. And then you're going to make the sale. And I don't care if they're motivated anymore, because they're right about the thing. Or if I'm teaching you a skill, I'm going to use cookies to help you learn how to tie your shoes. And at that high point of you being happy with cookies, you know how to tie your shoes. But the ability to tie your shoes is more important than cookies. So teaching a skill, oh, it's OK. But where it's really problematic is when you're changing someone in the long term, where you're trying to change someone's habits, where you're trying to build loyalty. Because that's where you can hurt people. And I think about Zamzi, and I get very concerned that Zamzi is getting kids addicted to getting points for exercising. But when the parent says, you know, I think I'm tired of giving Zamzi these $20 goals, well, then the kid's actually going to be less motivated to exercise than they were when they started. So is there a way to fix this? So games are about more than rewards. This is one definition of games, that games are a form of play with goals and structure. I mean, we can write that in equation form. Game equals play plus goals plus structure. Now, I have a degree in mathematics, so I have the ability to solve equations. So I'm going to solve this equation for play. If I subtract play from both sides, I get games without play is goals and structure. And if you think about what we've been talking about, that's reward-based gamification. But wait a minute. Games without play? That sounds pretty awful. What if we start thinking about the play? 
And I started thinking about that and came up with this idea of meaningful gamification, where the goal is the gamification is to make the context meaningful to someone, to avoid these rewards, but instead build intrinsic motivation. And I'm helping, gonna help you do that by presenting my recipe for meaningful gamification. These are six things you can do instead of using points and rewards to help encourage engagement in something. Reflection, exposition, choice, information, play, and engagement. And I'll talk about each one of those now. Play. Play is the optional exploration of a boundaried space. It gives you the freedom to fail. I looked at museums of science, museums of play, tried to look at, well, how do we create spaces that people will choose to explore? How do we create safe spaces to explore? And I'm very concerned with the talk in schools now of game-based assessment. Because if a game is a form of play, and you're telling kids, yes, you have to play for your grade, I'm a little worried about where that could go. That's no longer play, you know, that's something else. But think about creating a playful space where an important part of that is, is optional, that people have the choice to engage or not engage in your gamification. Exposition, or storytelling, or narrative. The picture up here is from MIT's Vanished. Vanished was a game run by the Education Arcade in partnership with the Smithsonian. And what they did is they had kids working with researchers at the Smithsonian throughout the summer. But what they were doing is watching the kids talk about what they thought was going on. And they changed the story to match up with some of the hypotheses. I use this in my classes. I actually let my students design their own syllabus or create their own narrative. And, and they get much more motivated when they've had a part, when they've been a co-designer with me in their learning experience. Information. So the idea of information is that it allows people to understand the why of what's going on. So if the gamification is gone, they still know what's happening. This is a picture from a hybrid car, a Kia hybrid car. And what happens is as you drive more efficiently, you get more flowers and you get more leaves, but you don't really understand what's happening. You can also see this view, which shows you the drivetrain, which shows you where the power comes from the tire, goes into the battery and gets sent out to the wheels. And if you've seen that, you can then adjust your driving habits because you understand what's making a difference. So information is important. Choice. Choice is the concept that you're gonna let people make choices. What you see here is a visualization of badge pathways. The concept of this is in schools that they assign badges to different types of learning, but the big difference is they let kids explore the badges as they wish. They let them take on different challenges or say, I wanna do this thing, and the teacher says, okay, if you wanna do this thing, here are some ways to get there. And it's using badges, but not as rewards. It's using them as information. And everything I talked about earlier, points, levels, leaderboards, they can all be used actually for a non-reward purpose. They can be used in ways to bring about more meaning. Engagement, and by this I mean social engagement. The Rochester Institute of Technology has this game called Just Press Play, where students in different programs come together and take on challenges through their first semester. And what it does is it actually builds engagement between students who normally would never see each other. And it's about building a community. And reflection. Jane McGonigal ran this game called Find the Future. I was one of the participants. 500 of us went to the New York Public Library and we wrote a book overnight. Not a very good book, but <laughs> we were launched into the library, we had lists of things to look at, and after we'd look at something, we'd come back to the reading room and we'd have a writing challenge. And that writing challenge forced us to reflect upon that. And at the end of the day, what actually happened is that those of us that came got to find things in the library that were really meaningful to us. So this is the recipe, reflection, exposition, choice, information, play, and engagement. Amy Jo Kim presented the player's journey, which is the idea of taking people on a journey of a path from taking them from being a newbie to being a regular to being an enthusiast. And the idea of this is that they get more engaged with the system as they go on. And I mapped what I've talked about to this journey. With reward-based gamification, it's when you take Daniel Pink's work into account, you realize you could use some rewards at the beginning, in the tutorial stage, in the onboarding stage, getting people involved. Kind of like Mario jumping over the barrels. But to get people to become a regular, you need to think about how to help them build meaning, how to help them give them a world to explore, to build themselves up. How can you do that? And how to build the enthusiasts? Well, for that, I think about World of Warcraft. Now, this is a video game that's been out for 10 years. And in video game worlds, that's an eternity. Although it's kind of funny, it's been, it's been reworked and replaced so many times. It's kind of like the guy that says, yeah, I've had this broom for 30 years. I've replaced the handle four times and the brush five times, but it's the same broom. So World of Warcraft looks very different than it did when it started. But the reason why people keep coming back to it is because of the communities. And these communities are where the engagement happens. This idea of a community of practice is a group of people that have come together around a topic. Communities of practice or affinity groups surround many contexts. And the idea of the gamification journey is you want to use gamification to help people find their place in a community of practice. 
And the idea is that as people go through these stages, as they go from newbie to explorer to enthusiast, that the role of the gamification decreases until at the end there's no gamification at all. And you've left people in a community. And you've made long-term change by helping them find a place with others. And that can be the role of gamification. Now you may think about how you could start in this. And the big tip I would give you to how to start is to play games mindfully. Not win games aggressively, but play games mindfully. Take your time, play games, play games you don't like. Play games you don't know about, play board games, play role-playing games. Go out in the woods and dress up like a wizard and shout fireball at people. And while you're doing this, while you're doing this, think about the play. What is motivating about this? Because as you're doing that, you're building up your toolkit. Talk to gamers. Gamers are a huge source of motivation. And if you're a gamer out there, I challenge you to take what you know about how you motivate people and how you're motivated by games and use it in the world. So by applying meaningful gamification, what I hope to help all of you to do is to motivate the people around you to use games and play, to tackle these big challenges, and to make the world a more playful place. Thank you.